I'm Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation, and it is Wednesday, April 25, 2018, and I am in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with Zane Bell. And my first question to you is to say your full name and spell it. Zane Bell. Zulu Alpha November Echo, Bravo Echo Lima Lima. Okay, we got it. Um, so first I want to know something about you and your childhood, where you're from, uh, and how you got to be interested in science. Well, I was born in New York City, uh, grew up there, um, attended Bronx High School of Science. Uh, I was always, I just was always interested in physical sciences. Um, attended Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York, and then really got into the physics, the physics program there and eventually went on to a, for a PhD at the University of Illinois in physics. And here I am. And here you are. Well, I met, a recru I met a recruiter and came to Oak Ridge and it seemed nice. And I was only going to be here uh, two, three, maybe four years. Well, now it's 40 years later and I'm still here. <laughs> That's marvelous. I keep hearing this story again and again. Well, I was going to be here two years and now it's been 20. <laughs> People seem to like it here. People do. People are friendly, climate's nice, four seasons, and winter is short. That's terrific. So tell me, um, what is it that you do here? I'm a senior uh, scientist working in radiation detector development. Uh, we des I design radiation detectors, uh, some of the electronics sometimes, uh, but my real interest is in scintillators and the detection, me uh, detection mechanisms. So what's a scintillator? A scintillator is a material that, when struck by ionizing radiation, such as X-rays, gamma rays, uh, charged particles, protons, electrons, um, the, it will emit light in response to that. And the amount of light is approximately uh, proportional to the energy that's deposited in the uh, material. Examples are sodium iodide, uh, cesium iodide, cadmium tungstate, plastics that are loaded with uh, phosphors, uh, liquids loaded with phosphors, those are organic materials, organic liquids, xylene and toluene based, um, and even some gases scintillate. So if um, my son was fascinated by fluorescent minerals, Mm -hmm. as a child. So these are some of the minerals you just named. Some of them are, indeed. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, when after the X-ray, the X-ray tube was invented in about 1895, um, Thomas Edison, who was working in New Jersey, uh, went to the American Museum of Natural History in New York and case by case took, borrowed, I shouldn't say took, borrowed their mineral collection and exposed it to X-rays. Some of them glowed and some of them didn't. All scintillators will respond to ultraviolet light and x-rays, but not everything that responds to ultraviolet will scintillate. It's a physics thing, word. but the way the scintillator works, uh, crystal is the easiest one to understand. In a crystal, you have a three-dimensional regular lattice of atoms. In the case of sodium iodide, it's sodium next to iodine, next to sodium, next to iodine in three dimensions. And for, it's a cube, cubic structure. Um, when ionizing radiation, say a gamma ray or x-ray goes into it, it causes electrons to be liberated from the atoms and they can travel around uh, the lattice uh, pretty freely. Uh, eventually they find a, a defect of some sort. In the case of sodium iodide crystals, people purposely put thallium metal into it. Thallium iodide is put in with the sodium iodide at about 20th of a percent. And when the electron, free electrons find these uh, thallium sites, um, they drop down to a lower energy state and light is emitted by the thallium ion. And that's picked up by a photosensor and that tells me uh, something happened. have these defects? Well, the, some are put in purposely, yes. like thallium is a, can, would be considered a defect in a pure sodium iodide lattice. Uh, other materials like cadmium tungstate um, 
don't don't require anything like thallium. They naturally do it because there are always uh, vacancies in the lattice. It's at a small level, small fraction of a percent, but those vacancies nonetheless are what, when electrons reach them, it looks like it looks as if there's an atom there without with the wrong amount of charge, and the electron interprets that as being an activator, and the same process occurs. Interesting. So this technique works. Mm -hmm. um, what application is there? Why are we interested in this? Well, we're interested in this for a lot of reasons. Uh, there are radioactive materials in the world. Um, naturally occurring is uranium, thorium, potassium. Uh, your bananas are radioactive a little bit, but not very much. There's very little potassium-40, comparatively speaking. Um, when, you have, when you go for a dental x-ray, that's radiation. Now, they don't put a scintillator in your mouth when they do that bite wing x-ray. But if you go for a CT scan at the hospital um, or fluoroscopy, uh, that's a scintillator that's generating the image. Um, and uh, that, that's, one, that's a major application. Other applications, scintillators are found, uh, used for research purposes, just for accelerators like uh, CERN or Fermilab or Brookhaven. Any of, the, any of the particle accelerators. Uh, and uh, that's the indication that there are people are studying the physics of some uh, process, and the result of the process is, radio, is particles, not, radio, not radioactivity, there's particles that fly out, and these are detected in, in detectors, of, in radiation detectors of various sorts. Um, they're used uh, in home inspections. Yeah, basements of homes um, in Pennsylvania, especially in the U.S., tend to accumulate radon gas, and you can detect the presence with scintillators. Um, where else would they be used? They're used in, by NASA in uh, probes uh, orbiting uh, the moon or the Earth, looking for radiation coming from the planet. And, from, and that radiation is typically caused by cosmic, cosmic neutrons uh, cosmic generated neutrons that reach the planet uh, get are, are captured by material at the planet's surface and then there's a gamma ray that comes out when that happens and if you wait long enough you'll see enough of them and be able to identify what materials are on the planet's surface. So NASA's interested in such things. Um, some uh, places you'll see along the highways you'll see uh, at truck stops you'll see radiation detectors people looking to make sure that uh, what's supposed to be in the truck is in fact in the truck and not something nefarious. So there are Homeland Security applications. So if you have a, a say a large truck, container sized truck, and you have a, a detector and you're looking for contraband radioactive materials, yeah, it some show up in, through the wall of the truck, or, through the boxes? Yeah, so it well, depends on, the, on what is what is radioactive in there. Alpha particles and beta particles that won't get through the truck, but the gamma rays will. Um, a, an issue I know several years ago for the steel, uh, scrap steel industry was, um, let's say, less than honest, maybe that's not the right word, but it's close enough, less than honest people getting rid of radioactive sources. Uh, a business goes bankrupt and happens to use radioactive source uh, for something in their, in their in their work um, and wants to get rid of it, but it costs money to dispose of a radioactive source. So what has been found from time to time is uh, somebody will put it in a junk car and take it to the scrapyard. Um, steel is fairly inexpensive, you know, it's like $25, no, 25 cents a pound maybe. Um, and this source will be put in the trunk. First thing that happens is, that, you know, when you take it to a scrap dealer, it'll be crushed, and it'll still be in the trunk of the car. The car is taken to the steel mill. The car is shredded by at the steel mill, and if they're unlucky, that source ended up with the steel gets thrown into a graphite crucible uh, and melted along with the steel. That's if they're unlucky, because then the vapors coming off that crucible when it's heated to melt the uh, iron will cause, if it's not a material, not a radioactive material that alloys with iron, it'll just go up in the vapors and be caught in their exhaust system. 
and most steel plants are not permitted for mixed waste, just hazardous waste. So, you know, they, they can throw away the ash, but they can't throw away radioactive ash, and they can't store it. So then they end up being shut down for a while until this gets cleaned up at fairly high, fairly high expense. And um, some steel plants, some scrap steel uh, plants like this, uh, it'll cost them $300 a minute that they're, short, that, they're, that they're shut down. They don't like this. So they're very interested in radioactive, in portal monitors that will detect radioactive material buried in a car. That's fascinating. Well, people do this, so, yeah, you know. That's the, interesting. Bottom line is important to a lot of people. Wow. It costs a lot of money then. It does when that happens. It's not particularly dangerous, you understand, because a small amount of radioactive material in tons of steel, you just never notice it. It won't bother anybody at all. But they do it because... Because it's too expensive for them to dispose of it in the correct way. Oh, because of regulations. Yeah. Well, no. not, not, I won't say regulations. I mean, these regulations are there for a purpose. It's so we don't end up with radioactive water in the water supply and radioactive meat, you know, that something gets into a food supply. That's what it's for. But still, you know, when we have radioactive waste to get rid of here, we bury it and we do it by the book. So it doesn't go anywhere and it stays put. And, you know, a commercial outfit can pay someone to do the same thing, but it costs the money. And if they're already bankrupt and going out of business, they don't have the money to do it. So sometimes this happens. Hmm. So people use radiation detectors to try and avoid that problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, fascinating. So um, tell, tell us about, um, more about your work about looking at new elements? And Not new elements, new materials. New materials. Uh, new combinations of uh, polymers uh, and, cr and uh, inorganic crystals to check for, see if they have a good response to radiation. For gamma radiation, you're looking for something that's dense and has materials in it like lead or tungsten, um, things with very high atomic, high atomic number. The best would be to use something that had uranium in it, but unfortunately uranium itself is radioactive and the crystal would be lit up all the time. So there's no point in doing that. Um, commercially, there are, tungst there are tungstate crystals that exist, uh, cadmium tungstate and zinc tungstate I can buy today. Uh, probably it's about uh, 10 to $40 per cubic centimeter for the material, um, which is affordable. You don't need very much material because the density of cadmium tungstate is about as close to eight, about that of steel. Um, so it, does, it doesn't take very much to stop uh, gamma rays and register events. It takes a little bit more with sodium iodide. Uh, so my interest, among my interests are high Z materials that uh, will still scintillate. Not all of them do. Uh, plenty of tungstates that don't do anything at all. But, and there are other materials. Uh, there are thallium compounds that have been reported to scintillate. I have not worked with them yet. Um, and on the lighter side, I mean, those are the materials that are useful for gamma rays and x-rays because they have the highest stopping power. The more dense they are and the higher the atomic number, the better it is uh, for stopping gamma rays. That's why lead is, the, is a shield and paper is not so good at it. On the other hand, if I'm looking to detect neutrons, I want something with lots of hydrogen in it. Um, plastic scintillator exists, um, and I can buy it. It's commercial. Let's see, buy it. Here's a, a piece of one, small piece. Uh, it comes pretty much looking like this, right out of the mold. It's molded. It's uh, cast material. This one happens to glow blue uh, in, when, in response to radiation. But you can also make scintillators that are made of silicone rubber, like bathroom caulk. So this one is flexible. If I threw it on the floor, it would bounce. This one also, I think, glows blue. Yes, this one also glows blue. Um, this has been around for a while. Uh, it's not quite bathroom caulk, but it's similar. It's a silicone rubber. So what, give us some examples of what that would be used for. This kind of thing? This you can cast in large sheets, just like in cast plastic. Um, the advantage of this is there's no machining. 
uh, of this kind of thing. You can cast it in pretty much any shape you want, whereas plastic is best cast in uh, slabs or cylinders. Uh, this I could, if I have a device, of, uh, an instrument of some sort, that I wanted to, which, uh, and I want this device to detect radiation in addition to whatever else it does, and it just has some random spaces. I can pour the silicone uh, fluid in it, polymerize it in place, and just take up excess space with this flexible material. I can't do that with plastics. The, the starting materials in making plastics are, uh, will dissolve other plastics. Uh, the stuff that you that you have in heat that's in this material doesn't is pretty inert, even before it's polymerized. So it won't attack other plastics. Uh, we cast this in generally a glass vial, and I just shatter the vial to take it out. And this does not require an oven. Uh, plastic scintillator has to be polymerized at about uh, 60 degrees C um, for about two weeks to make it. This I can do in. 20 hours and cast a sheet pretty much as much as large as I want. There's no heat generated in the polymerization reaction, uh, which is different, which in the case of plastics, they, there, there is heat and you have to carefully control the temperature of the polymerizing mass. This, this is, I would say, it really is just like setting up bathroom caulk. But a very versatile, is it very expensive? I mean no, it's on the order of a few dollars per cubic centimeter to make this stuff. Not horribly expensive. There are far more expensive scintillators that, I can, that are commercially available. Um, some of them cost uh, a few hundred dollars per cubic centimeter. They aren't used in big slabs. They're used in handheld detectors. A couple, few companies make them. Because otherwise, why would they not make it that one? Well, this would not be very useful for gamma rays because it's pretty light. Uh, this is about a, gram per, a little bit over a gram per cc in density. Uh, and this and like, like plastics are also about like that. It not quite, doesn't quite float in water. Um, the scintillators that are used for uh, handheld uh, radioactive identifier, identifiers um, are typically sodium iodide, um, and those have a density of about four and a, three and a half to four and a half, depending on which, what crystal is actually in it. So it's much better at, at uh, stopping gamma rays, and that's, what, that's the intent. You have to match your scintillator to the application. Uh, you know, about 120 years ago, if you wanted to work in uh, Rutherford's laboratory in England, I mean, there is a Rutherford laboratory now in England, uh, but this is when the real Rutherford was alive. Uh, one of the tests for the uh, for a, a uh, applicant was to sit in a dark room for a half an hour, then be presented with a zinc sulfide uh, screen. Uh, that and a, had a little radioactive source on it, and he had to sit there with a uh, count, a mechanical counter, and count the flashes. And if he couldn't do that, he was encouraged to pick a different career. Um, you know, zinc sulfide is a very well-known scintillator. It's been around at least a hundred years, maybe more. Um, you know about the radium watch dial painters? Why don't you just tell us about it? Oh well. This was, uh, I don't know if it was considered a scandal then, about 100 years ago, but uh, watches today, of course, have L LCD displays or LED displays on them. Uh, well, for us, it's not a problem. We have batteries. But 120 years ago, batteries didn't exist like we have today, and you couldn't illuminate your display at night, so how do you know what time it is? Well, what people realized they could, uh, Madame Curie had recently figured out the chemistry to separate radium from uranium uh, ore. And um, if you mix that radium with zinc sulfide, uh, it'll glow, the, glow green in the dark. It'll glow, glow green all the time. You just can't see it uh, during the daytime. But at night, it's very visible. Um, things like this were used in the uh, Second World War on, in, in air, aircraft and ships uh, when they were, had to operate at night and couldn't turn their lights on for fear that an enemy uh, would see it. But these little glow-in-the-dark uh, displays work just fine. Uh, even to, today, you can probably go to an antique store and find the radium watch dial. And with the people who were painting these were young women in their 20s, typically. Um, and they were given camel hair, very fine camel hair brushes, and they just painted the numerals with this uh, zinc sulfide radium uh, chloride paint.
And of course, if you've ever done any painting, your brush tip eventually gets frays a bit, so what do you do? Well, they got the stuff all over their fingers, got it all over their faces, and sometimes they paint their faces purposely just to amuse people at night. Because it would glow in the dark, so they'd have a little, you know, you could have a smiley face, whatever you wanted. Um, every one of those workers died of horrible cancers of the tongue, uh, jaw, f uh, skin cancers on the face. They all died. How long did it take to uh, manifest? Oh, about five to ten years. So it was very intense. Uh, yeah, it was really obvious that that was the cause. And people at the time, you know, 19, around World War I era, people, I mean, people knew there was danger with radiation. Uh, I mean, Thomas Edison had one of his, one of his um, assistants really, I mean, he basically burned his finger, one of his fingers off with an x-ray machine. They didn't know then, but then they figured out what it was. Uh, he died. Uh, you know, because you're standing next to an, an x-ray machine and it's running at high voltage and no concept of health physics at the time. So people got sick and died. And these uh, watch dial painters, um, pretty much the same thing happened. Radium uh, is an alpha particle emitter, which does a lot of damage to cells, but only for a few micrometers, five to 10 micrometers deep into the skin. That's enough to get past the epidermis and the dead cells that are, all, that are already on your skin and get into the actual flesh. And then that causes, uh, that causes the cancers. Reading, I wonder if you could um, explain the causes of Marie Curie's death because I think at the time same thing, she basically contaminated herself with all the radioactive material that she was that she was working with, and you know around 1900 or so, people just did, didn't know just how dangerous it could be, and she was working with tons of uranium, of uranium ore to extract grams of radium. It's about a million to one or so uh, in uranium ore, natural uranium ore, about a gram of radium in a ton of ore. So, and she was separating all the um, daughter products, most of which are radioactive. Um, and so basically she contaminated herself, she contaminated her laboratory. What else <laughs> should we talk about? You have other samples here. Oh yeah, I brought a few props. Okay. Uh, just in case you'd find, you all would find them interesting, you know, like this piece of silicone rubber. No, this is fascinating. Uh, what else do you have here? Well, I've got all kinds. This thing glows, in the, this thing glows when hit with the ultraviolet light from uh -huh. my lamp. It's blue. This is the hard plastic. It's also blue. A little different color blue. It all depends on the organic dyes that are in it. These are other silicone rubber samples that we made, and one of them is greenish, and the other is blue. That's all the question of what dyes. Um, these, yeah, these are not, not sensitized for neutrons. These probably, these were from experiments to see if we can get the thing, get the rubber to, to polymerize. Sometimes it doesn't. You put wrong things in and prevents it from polymerizing completely. Now these are things that are not scintillators but they glow different colors. This one is a glass that has europium in it, and this one is a marble with, this marble I got off eBay, and it has uranium oxide in it. You buy it, it's per perfectly safe to have. It's a commercial, it's a consumer product. Uh, but this, but neither of these things scintillate. So the rule of thumb is even though, if it fluoresces, if it doesn't fluoresce, it probably doesn't scintillate. If it does fluoresce, it still might not. But it's an easy way to get to, to um, select for things that might. Oh, Not all detectors are scintillators. This is a piece of cad cadmium zinc, uh, cadmium, zinc cadmium zinc telluride. It's a semiconductor. And this works much like a gas proportional counter would work. Uh, gamma ray would go into it. The gold uh, piece, the gold uh, foils on it are for electrodes. Uh, and the gamma ray will make electrons and the electrons leave behind holes in the lattice. Uh, and 
by, by applying voltage across opposite faces, like where my fingers are, you can separate that charge and you can collect it. And from the amount of charge you collect, you know the energy of the gamma ray that was in, that interacted. This has no optics at all. And it's a density of about five and a half. Uh, but this is not cheap. And the primary users of this kind of material is the medical community for uh, imagers. Well, if a dentist puts a, a, a um, detector in your mouth for a bite wing x-ray, it's probably cadmium zinc telluride that he's using or she's using. I, I don't grow these materials myself. Um, I work with other people at uh, universities and other places in the laboratory where we might investigate um, semiconductors that involve, that use uh, high atomic number of materials like mercury or lead, bismuth. So when you say you don't grow these materials, how, how are they manufactured? Well, th there are people who do grow this stuff. They grow, you're saying grow. Though. Yeah, like growing, a, like growing a, you grow a crystal. Uh, is that how that works? Uh, pretty much. You take uh, cadmium telluride, and this, to do this stuff, you take cadmium telluride and zinc telluride, um, and put them, grind them up in a, with a mortar and pestle, put them in a, in a glass ampule and seal it, and then heat it up to about 900 centigrade. And it'll react and crystallize in, as this material. And it'll look just like that? Well, it won't have the gold foils on them, but it'll be, it's yeah. a dark material, and that's how you grow that. Sodium iodide is grown from a melt also. You take sodium iodide powder and thallium iodide powder, mix them up in the right proportion, put them in a crucible and heat them generally with a, a micro, a micro, I don't know if it's microwave, it's an, it's an RF uh, furnace, heat them, and then you take a small crystal of sodium iodide Put it, touch it to the top of the melt and start withdrawing it like at a millimeter or two per hour. And this material will stick to that and crystallize in the same crystal orientation as the, the seed crystal. And you just pull it up. Um, and sodium iodide is grown by the ton uh, in the U.S. each year. Uh, cadmium tungstate and zinc tung tungstate are also grown like that. Um, Lithium, uh, not lithium, um, lutetium orthosilicate is grown like that, and that's done actually very close to us here. Um, uh, that, that's done by Siemens. Uh, they, they grow the stuff. The furnaces are out somewhere near the airport. Uh, and they run 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they run their furnaces. And they're mostly serving Servicing the medical industry? That, yeah, uh, lutetium orthosilicate, uh, it's also called, called LSO, um, does uh, its primary, serve, uh, primary purpose is the medical community, PET scanners. Can you just, since you say PET, can you just spell that out and... Positron it? Emission Tomography Systems. Say it again, I'm sorry. Positron Emission Tomography Systems. Explain how that works. That's magic. That's no, right? it's magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you put, if you, you can make radioactive isotopes that emit uh, positrons. Sodium 22 does it, but the ones of interest for medical uh, community is fluorine 18 and carbon 11. Um, so you can make a sugar with flu uh, that where the, some of the hydrogen is substituted with uh, uh, substituted by fluorine 18. The half life is about two hours. So you don't have much time to make it, but the process is known. So uh, you'll have a cyclo you'll make the fluorine 18 with a cyclotron on site. Um, they will make the sugar from the fluorine 18 uh, with the fluorine 18, and then you'll inject it in the in the patient. And uh, that the place where you have a tumor will generally you it has a higher metabolism than the rest of your body because that's why it's a tumor. It's rapidly dividing, um, and it will uh, take up the uh, sugar with the fluorine in it faster than the rest of your body does. Uh, but it can't do you can't metabolize that that fluorinated sugar, so it just sits there. But in the meantime, you can look at the, when the positrons come out of the fluorine, um, they don't get very far before they slow down and are captured and 
and annihilate with an electron that's somewhere nearby. Uh, that causes the emission of two gamma rays that come at 180 degrees apart. So you have detectors that 100, they have a, an array of detectors, and you get coincidences between detectors on opposite sides of the patient. By analyzing the uh, order of things, you know, where things are, are uh, being detected, which, which pairs of detectors are firing and when, um, you can con reconstruct a picture of the distribution of the radioactive material in the body with something like millimeter or so in resolution. So you, you find with the PET scanner, you find the regions of the body that are um, biologically active. And if you use a different molecule than that, you'll, you can tailor it to whatever part of the body, I suppose, uh, takes up that particular molecule. If you did with a radioactive iodine compound, you'd image the thyroid really well. So usually they are used for diagnostics, and can you do therapy at the same time? That's diagnostic only. Diagnostic. No, the, the, the dose to the patient is fairly small. Mm. Uh, you, a dose to a patient, to a cancer patient, you want to kill a tumor. Um, people do use x-rays for that because the tumor is so rapidly, is full of rapidly dividing cells. Radiation will kill those a lot faster than it will kill the rest of the cells in your body. So the, the tumor is more susceptible. Uh, it's why you do, you do brain tumors. You treat brain tumors with radiation uh, because brain cells don't uh, divide very readily, on, don't, don't divide rapidly on their own. You, know, you got your brain, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's as good as it's going to get. But the tumor is, very, is atypical and it's, it's, ma it's growing rapidly. So the radiation interrupts that, uh, the uh, cell division process and the cells die. Most, mutated, most mutations in cells kill the cell. So, of course, in, even in uh, radiotherapy, you have to have detectors around to know what, what dose you're giving the patient. Scintillators are used for this from time to time. So you, oh, you also have applications for this, right, for material sciences? Well, sure. Uh, some wear and tear in a reactor. There is that. Um, that was one of the primary missions in o at ORNL years ago. It still is to some extent, but we don't build too many reactors anymore. Um, and when I first came here, I was measuring neutron cross sections for that purpose, structural materials. Uh, when you expose materials to high flux of neutrons, uh, the neutrons can be will be captured. And, um, we'll ch and the material transmutes. You know, the Philosopher's Stone problem of uh, a thousand years ago was finding something that would turn lead into gold. Well, I, I, can turn I can turn gold into mercury. I know how to do that. I unfortunately don't know how to turn lead into gold. It's the wrong way in the periodic table to do it. Um, but that's what happens. Uh, iron in, a, in rebar or in I-beams in, in a reactor um, exposed to neutrons will eventually turn into cobalt. And it'll have, the, and you're there, if you have a high enough flux for a long enough time, and reactors typically have lifetimes of 20 years or more. I mean, hyfer has been around uh, more than 20 years. Um, it's been here ever since I was here, and that was 40 years ago. Um, so exposed long enough and, with an, and to enough of a, of a neutron flux, you will f change the mechanical properties of these materials. So people measure neutron cross-sections to know how fast or dam is damage going to occur, and people measure samples that have been irradiated to see what, da see what happens. Um, and of course, to me measure the cross-sections, you have to detect neutrons and gamma rays, and that's where these radiation detectors come in. My personal interests are understanding the physics and chemistry of materials for radiation detection. Uh, in the course of doing that, of course, I build radiation detectors for specific applications. I mean, I write proposals, I sometimes get funded, and I go do it. Um, something I've been doing now for, I guess, if I count my graduate career, uh, something on the order of 45 years. Um, the, I mean, it's just, it's all, it's all a bunch of steps. 
you know, you, I start doing neutron, uh, photo neutron measurements in graduate school, uh, irradiating materials um, and causing neutrons to be emitted by these materials. Uh, this was basic physics, understanding how gamma rays interact with nuclei and the structure of nuclei. And um, then I came here, and since I already knew how to do neutron detection and build detectors, um, I, could, I got into uh, neutron cross-sections. I was recruited to work at the accelerator, which has now been uh, decommissioned, uh, the, the Orella, the, the electron linac that we have or had. Um, and from that, you know, it got into, well, how do I actually make the scintillators that I am buying now? Can I do better? That's just a curious mind kind of thing, and one thing leads to another. And in some cases, I've made, silicon, made scintillators that didn't other, otherwise exist. Um, I won't, they're not commercial successes, but they're certainly interesting that I can do it. And I've made things with them. Um, and leads sometimes to from scintillators, it leads to semiconductors. The physics is not that different, but it, there are some differences. And uh, I've been doing it long enough now that, you know, it's, it still interests me, so I haven't, I haven't retired yet. That's great. That's great. Are there um, young people coming along that are going to pick up uh, or have you know, gotten engaged in this? There are. Um, most of them are now in nuclear engineering, come out of nuclear engineering curricula rather than physics curricula. Um, they cert they're certainly capable, most of, most of the ones I've seen are capable. Some of them, of course, like the Rutherf Rutherford's applicants, maybe they should seek a different profession. Uh, but for the most part, they, they want to be good instrumentation engineers. Uh, most of them are not really looking at basic physics. Um, to some extent, I think uh, a lot of people in the world think that uh, uh, we know all the physics we need to know about scintillators, uh, and we don't really have to do much research. Let's just try them now, try different things. Well, then the question is, well, how do you know which, what materials to try? I know zinc tungstate's a scintillator. I know cadmium tungstate is a scintillator. What about mercuric tungstate? It's the next one down the periodic table. Well, it too is a scintillator, but it turns out you can't make it. Um, it's uh, very fresh. You can't melt the material. The, if you make the, make the compound and try to melt it, it just simply decomposes, which is not the desired result. It's actually very hard to grow that. We did try it, and we did make a few tiny little crystals, millimeter size, but it was not uh, would not be as I'd call it an astounding success. The silicone rubber was much more of a success, and the fact that it worked. Uh, really well, and not only could I make it just with silicone rubber and a phosphor, but I could also put in materials to make it very sensitive to neutrons. I could put, I could put boron in there, and I could put gadolinium in there. We never did, we never did get, we never did w try to put lithium in, but probably can be done. Um, so you have to, you have to be able to do the, you have to understand the physics of, uh, of these solids. And you have to, in order to say, well, if I change this out, what's gonna, what do I expect to happen? Um, that's the way people do it now most of the time. We do, calcu we do calculations uh, to decide what materials to put together, what has a chance, versus the Edisonian approach, which is just line them up and try them. Well, you know, I tried to make mercuric tungstate. Well, it didn't work. All right, go on to the next one. We need a plus two... Um, uh, we need a plus. We need a plus two cation. Uh, we need so. All right. Well, zinc and cadmium are like that. Oh, what about uh, calcium? Also, is a plus two ion. Oh yeah, it does work too. Actually, Edison found that. That was one of the first things he found that calcium tungstate scintillates. Uh, well, what's on the, what about magnesium? That's the one above calcium in the periodic table. As far as I know, it doesn't. Um, what about lithium tungstate? That's two lithium ions and the tungstate ion. Well, it might. We're not sure. We haven't tried to grow the crystal yet, but uh, we have done the calculations, and there's a chance it'll do it. Uh, but we'll, we have to actually, you know, that's one of the ones where maybe it'll work. Uh, but then on the right next to it among the alkaline earths is, you know, well, there's magnesium to try, calcium we know, 
um, strontium tungstate would be the next one to try, barium tungstate, and the one after that would be radium tungstate, but there's probably no point in trying radium tungstate since radium, radium is radioactive, the crystal will be lit up all the time. So there's really no point in that one, not for radiation detection. There may be other things to do with it, but not that. So I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a matter of curiosity to keep on to do, to do this stuff. I guess that's a, a key element of being a scientist. Probably so. Uh, I don't know if I'm a better scientist than I am an engineer or not. Uh, I mean, I, I like to make things work, or figure out why they work or how they work. Um, sometimes I, I'm astounded that something does work, uh, but more often than not, it doesn't work. <laughs> it, it's um, hours and hours of boredom followed by a few moments of elation. That's good. That's pretty much it. Huh. Well, that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's wisdom that people have to uh, understand. Yeah, and what I've seen over my career uh, not only, well, I've not only just had a long career, but at one point I was an editor of a technical journal, and it was never ceased to amaze me how the wheel is reinvented about every 20 years. It seems these days that if a researcher doesn't find the reference with Google uh, or some other search engine it, within five to ten minutes, that person will assume this has never been done before and will file for a patent or will write an article saying I, what I've done is the best thing since sliced bread. And then some old geezer like me looks at the paper and says, you know, I remember in this book published in 1964 that I read, um, and I have a copy of it, there's a section on this very topic. And then I write my review of the paper and I say, it's very nice, but you failed to mention this book from 45 years ago. And the response would be, oh, you got to do your homework. But that's just the way the world is these days. You know, if I can't find it up with my, with my mobile phone, um, it probably doesn't exist. Huh. I've had lots of good patent, patentable ideas that I was just like 100 years too late. <laughs> Someone beat me to the patent office with it. But I do have seven patents to my name where I did beat people to the patent office. So what I'm holding here is a cadmium tungstate crystal. It's got cadmium and got tungsten. It's a very dense material, and it glows uh, blue-green when it's hit by radiation. I don't have a radioactive source here, but it's sitting on an ultraviolet light, which will excite it as soon as we turn the lights off. Can you get the light switch over there? Oh, there it is. Ooh. So right now the light is on, and we see the blue-green glow. The crystal is transparent, and if I turn the light off, we're in total darkness. And now it's back on. So a photo, photo multiplier would sit here or here and view the crystal uh, and look for the blue flashes of blue light and generate an electro electrical pulse every time that happens. So what I've got in this box is a marble that has uranium oxide in it and a piece of glass that has europium in it and indium also, I know, but the indium I know does not glow. Uh, the indium is there so that if neutrons uh, strike this, the indium captures the neutrons and emits electrons and gamma rays uh, and since this is really not a scintillator, what happens is there's something called the, the Cherenkov effect, where charged particles like electrons traveling faster than the speed of light in the material cause uh, the emission of blue light, much like a sonic boom happens when you exceed the speed of light in air, uh, speed of sound in air. Um, this, without sh putting this up to a gamma ray source, pretty much nothing happens. Put up to neutrons and you can see the Cherenkov light from the, after the capture. Now these are examples of things that will glow under, will fluoresce uh, green, or in this case the europium is what's fluorescing red, um, under a black light, a UV lamp. Um, but if I hit this with radiation, pretty much nothing happens. So all things that fluoresce 
Well, not all things that fluoresce will scintillate, but all things that scintillate do fluoresce. So what I'm holding here, is this a good place? Mm -hmm. What I'm holding here is a set of scintillators embedded in these, uh, plast in these uh, plastic tubes and connected by glass, by glass pipe. So what happens is this is, this can be, this is a position sensitive detector. So here's the glowing scintillator. Put the lamp here and nothing really glows. And put the lamp here and you see it. And put it over there, you see it. Well, okay, now I'm gonna hold it so that, is this facing the camera? Mm -hmm. So now if I do it, you'll see the very bright glow out the end of the glass pipe. This is an example of total internal reflection. The light from the scintillator bounces around the glass and bounces at the glass-air interface. And because the index of refraction of air is uh, smaller than that of the glass, the light is, um, is reflected from the surface and travels down the pipe until it gets to the end and you see that blue, blue glow. Now, as I move this across, you see that the, gl the glow is brighter now, gets dimmer when I go further away from it, and even more dim when I at the last scintillator. So if I put a photomultiplier tube at each, at each end of this glass, these glass rods and look at the amount of light that's generated at each photomultiplier, I can get an idea of where in, the, in this chain the event happened, whether it's this scintillator, this scintillator, or this scintillator. And these are the silicone rubber scintillators, so this whole thing is flexible. So I could wrap this around a drum if I wanted to, or wrap it around a person. This is just an example of a position-sensitive scintillator, scintillation detector.